welcome to Mondo and Friends presented by Verizon. My name is Mondo Fresco and today I am joined by a living legend, actor, director, entrepreneur, activist, Mr. Edward James Olmos. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure, an honor, and a privilege to be with you guys. I really thank appreciate you, thank the you. work that you do for the entire community, let alone, you know, for us, you know, bring understanding to the community. But the whole show is amazing. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, when we created the show, we had a few names and and people that we wanted to, to bring onto the show. And your name just kept coming up. And we wanted to have... Mr. Olmos here. And then as we, we're into season three now, as we were going into season one, two, and three, our guest kept mentioning a certain person all the time, and that was you. I know you, you got a chance to watch the, the Luis Guzman uh, yeah, piece. Yeah, I did, I saw it. And he, yeah. he, he loved you too, he mentioned you uh, in our conversation. Luis is amazing, uh, as a human being, incredible as an artist even more so he's a giant as an artist uh, his ability to uh, tell stories and, and give emotional understanding to the stories is amazing and he's been a friend of mine for a long long time probably since he started yeah yeah he mentioned that <laughs> the, does does it ever come to mind or, or do you realize the impact that that you've had I mean in order for all these these amazing talented guests that we've had here to, to bring you up in conversation. Does, does it ever strike you? Do you ever think about that? You know, I am so grateful. I live a privileged life and I'm very, very grateful for the understanding that uh, people have given me, you know, the kindness, the respect uh, that they've given me. And I understand it because basically back in 1964, when I started, you know, acting at East LA Community College, um, I was a rock and roll singer, and I was singing on the, on the Sunset Strip, and um, I wanted to combine uh, to get a little better on my presentations and stuff. So I said, I'll, you know, I'll take a theater class at East LA, you know. So I was at East LA College getting my Associate of Arts degree and uh, in sociology and criminal law, and uh, and at the same time I was singing rock and roll and. Uh, and so I took the class and, and I started working with live performances in rock and roll and live performances in theater together. And then uh, I did that. And this is the part that most people don't really get. Um, there was, you know, at the time Anthony Quinn had not, I guess he might have written his book by then, but by the time I read it was past that. Uh, and I found out that he was uh, Mexican. He was Mexican. I did, had no idea. Anthony Quinn does not read. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't think of my, of being a, a, a Mexican name, but his father was the Quinn. His mother was Mexican. He was born in Mexico, and uh, wonderful human being. I knew him very well. And uh, but anyway, so I had uh, a few people that uh, I could watch that were. were inside of my culture, you know. Uh, Jose Ferrar, who was phenomenal. I think he's probably one of the best. Him and Raul Julia yeah. are two of the giants that have ever lived and, and done this kind of work of telling stories in theater and motion picture. And, uh, and I, knew, I knew them both, and I was very grateful. And I met them after I, you know, I started working in theater. And, and I did theater uh, uh, almost every day at school, you know, and we'd um, have, um, I'd, I'd work at night on the Sunset Strip at Gazzari's, and uh, I did it for like, uh, Gazzari's, I, I spent a good four years, seven nights a week, wow. performing on the Strip, Eddie James in the Pacific Ocean, and uh, I had a wonderful experience, it was great. I love that, Singapore, Eddie James in the Pacific, Pacific Ocean. Ocean. We're the biggest thing on the West Coast. No. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. that. <laughs> I love that. I, I heard that you performed for the like with the Rolling Stones in the building, with the Beatles in the building that you were in, Frank Sinatra, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I worked. What had happened was that in 1968, I got asked to perform at a nightclub, another one, a big one, uh, called The Factory. 
which is owned by Paul Newman and quite a few, Pierre Salinger, and uh, a lot of really big names own this club. And um, it was a very exclusive club, though. It was different than Gazzari's. Gazzari's was just a rock and roll club. This was the most high-end club that existed at that time, where people could go and not be bothered by paparazzi, not be bothered by by people, and because everybody that was in that room uh, was at a very high level of, of their artistic endeavor. Everybody, Judy Garland, oof, I mean, the name was Barbara Streisand, uh, everybody was there. The Stones, the Beatles, uh, you name it, they would come and eat there and, and they would dance to us. Wow. I would be singing, they'd be dancing, I'd be sweating all over them. They would, <laughs> you know, and uh, we perform, perform alongside of uh, like Tina Turner and wow. quite a few other people that would come in and, and, and showcase there also. And so we played there for two years, seven nights a week. And uh, uh, at the same time, going to college. And uh, so I was able to encompass theater and music yeah. and dancing and producing music and writing music. And um, all of that together, when 1978 came, um, it, I was ready. I was ready and, and, and I, I got the opportunity to use my craft, everything that I was doing at yeah. that time, in a very special uh, uh, presentation called Zoot Suit. And I played El Pachuco, and uh, it was some. It was a character that no one was ready for. They, they had no idea that they there was even <laughs> the ability to understand this character, especially on stage. And um, Luis Valdez wrote the play. It's mm -hmm. a beautiful, beautiful play. And uh, like I said at the beginning, I had no role models, really. Right. But then. Through my experience of, of walking through this, I found out that there was no parts. There was no ab ability to perform in film and television and theater. Uh, you know, Zoot Suit was the very first play, uh, Latino play, yeah. to ever go on, on, on to Broadway. Yeah. I'm not talking about, you know, they did uh, West Side Story, but West Side Story is like studying uh, Puerto Rican as you would study uh, the Polynesian people in South Pacific. Right. They used it as part of the, of the uh, environment, but it really wasn't about their culture in that way, you know? So where this piece of work was truly uh, one of a kind, and uh, it went, we went on to do that. So like I'm saying, I had no, no, nothing to look at. Right, there was no blueprint for you. And there was no way of working. Yeah. I mean, I, I couldn't perform. I mean, everything that they gave me at that time in the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, was, you know, very various uh, uh, um, roles that were, that were uh, you know, stereotypical at, the, at right. the highest level. They were stereotypes at the highest level. And that's like the lowest level you can get. Yeah. Because uh, basically, when you talk about a stereotype, you're talking about an understanding that there's a truth in a stereotype. There's a truth there. And there, that, that's the reason why that kind of behavior is understood. And, but when it's the only thing you see on that culture, you know, the maid, the prostitute, yeah. the drug dealer. The thug, yeah. The thug, the gangbanger. And you get into that realm, and that's all you see, then that stereotype becomes very negative, mm -hmm. bad for the culture. And so that's all we had going, you know. And uh, so by the time we came out with Zoot Suit, uh, people were ready. It was like giving somebody a glass of water in the middle of the desert. Yeah. You know, they, they were so grateful when they saw that place. It was, it was groundbreaking. I... Uh oh, it was, it, people would cry. They would cry. And, uh, and they would cry because they were happy happy that finally they could see themselves for one. Right. But more than that, that it was so well done. 
was inspirational, and it was done in a way that was so high caliber. Mm -hmm. The performances were top notch. Great artistry, great storytelling, and a great story to tell. Mm -hmm. You know, the Zutsu was a great story to tell. And so with that being said, that's when my life changed, the life of the Latino, especially Chicano, changed. And a newfound respect, you could feel it, was felt. And that's when everyone really said thank you to me by the respect and kindness that they gave me. And it's now, it's been, that was in 78, so now, you know, over 40 years. <laughs> wow. You know, in, in middle school, uh, we were given the play, we were given the book, The Zoot Suit. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't a big reader then. Mm -hmm. I, I I wouldn't read as much, um, so and we had a, cl a, a a class test, an exam coming. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I went across the street to my local, um, uh, what was it like a where we were rent videos, mm -hmm. right? And I rented the Zoot Suit, the movie, <laughs> the movie. <laughs> so thanks to you, Mister Olmos, I passed the exam. <laughs> I didn't get to, to, to re, you know, view the, the book. I didn't finish the book, but I said, man, I, I still have like half the book left. I'm going to go watch. And luckily, uh, the, the, the local uh, video rental place had, had the movie. And, um, you know, I, I loved it. I watched it when I was, how old I was? I think I was like maybe 13 years old. <laughs> yeah, Luis did a wonderful job. Yeah. Of, of bringing about the understanding of that period in time. And he did a great job. He directed us. He was, he was the creator of the Teatro Campesino back in the early 60s. And, and uh, he's the most advanced uh, poet, historian, uh, author, mm -hmm. uh, playwright that uh, Chicano that we've ever had, bar none. And uh, because of the work that he's been able to accomplish with his teatro, and with the work that he's done on stage. So, uh, you know, it's, it was an honor and a privilege to be able to to work with him in that manner. And that play changed the course of uh, American history. Yeah, big yeah. Time. I mean, it was much more than people could have ever expected. And the people came over and over and over again. I'm not kidding you. People would go and come and they'd, they'd see the play 25, 30 times. Wow. Over the years that it performed here in in L.A., it was at the Mark Taper, and then it moved. We bought the. It was so successful that the Mark Taper bought the Aquarius Theater. You know, and, and uh, they bought that theater and they renovated it and they put our show in there and it stayed in there for years. Wow. Yeah paid for it <laughs> i know that you you were into sports i know you love the dodgers right hence, oh, yeah. yeah hence the, the socks so. there because <laughs> we're playing today man so i put my good luck socks on. i know you love baseball yeah, I do. um i know you love music right you were you were a a, a rock star in, in your own right and you just love the arts um i had a boss when i first started in radio mm -hmm. uh within a year i started doing television i was a television host i was a radio host um i was djing and he sat me down and told me mondo stick to one thing and one thing only mm -hmm. now i know you are multifaceted <laughs> what are your thoughts on people in the industry telling someone young what to do what not to do i mean advice and wisdom, unbelievable. It's so good. I mean, I'm grateful when somebody helps somebody. That's the key to, to not only to the person receiving the information, but the person giving the information. That person giving the information actually gets more out of it than the person receiving it. Hmm. Okay? And you don't get it until you get it. But, yeah, I mean, to limit somebody, you have to be careful. You know, I would never say, <laughs> don't do everything you want to do. You know, <laughs> I, I say, do everything you want to do, but remember to discipline yourself to do it when you don't feel like doing it. Hmm. Okay. And uh, it's something that uh, I will say that is probably the key to my success. That's what I learned in baseball. 
I learned at a very young age of four or five years old how to catch a ball. I couldn't catch a ball. I couldn't throw a ball. I couldn't hit the ball. Okay. I knew nothing about the game. And so then I started to play and with my neighbors and, and against the wall at my house, the garage wall where we lived, just threw it right there. Right here in East LA on the corner of First and Indiana, right there by the Mercado. The Mercado wasn't there in the, in, in the 50s, 40s and 50s when I was born, but um, it came in the 60s. But um, right there in Cheeseboro Lane, that's where my life began. And uh, I gotta say that I learned to play the game and I played it every day as a little kid. And, uh, you know, I, I see, I, you know, it was interesting because it's not the only thing I did. And I rode my bike, I played my kids, I'd go watch TV. Well, we didn't even have TV until the 50s. And so it was, I remember the first time we got a television set. It was a big box with a round thing there. And we would sit there and watch the, the, the uh, Indian head. Oh, yeah, 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 we'd yeah. watch it you know we'd sit there watching it and, and did nothing but just a placeholder <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, holding it to the fact that you were receiving the signal from the television network then at about five o'clock it would go on and ooh, wow. Lord, the world would change for you because we were watching this and television really took over and helped a lot it helped it was it was you know a lot of people don't like it. it's like modern technology a lot of people are afraid of it it's, it's an inspiration if you know how to discipline yourself. Okay? Yeah. Key. Key is to make yourself do the things you love to do when you don't feel like doing them. And to be able to discipline yourself to do the things you don't like to do. Okay? So that you'll have the discipline to do the things you love to do. Right. When you don't feel like doing them. And when I learned all these little things, by playing baseball, uh, I played every day, seven days a week, for from the age of maybe six, five or six, all the way through to fourteen, and I became very good at playing baseball. You do something seven days a week is like you ask any musician, you ask any true artist that has ever really, really understood their craft and understood themselves mm -hmm. in the craft. They will tell you, "Yeah, I did it every day, and it's no big deal." I agree with him. It's no big deal. It, unless there's a day you don't feel like doing it. On that day, that's where the discipline comes in. You make yourself do it, okay? And what ends up happening is that you end up becoming the best that you can be. Not better than so-and-so or so-and-so. You know, I never tried to be uh, better than anyone on, in anything not playing baseball, not singing rock and roll, not, not acting on stage, not, no. I just want to be the best that I could be doing what I was doing, okay? And, and it worked. Yeah. That discipline worked. And through discipline, Rondo, through discipline, determination, yeah. perseverance, and the key ingredient to the entire structure is patience allowing yourself to grow. Mm -hmm. So this year, I was doing it to this level. I did it all the 365 days into the next year, and I'm at another level. It doesn't mean that, I was, that I'm better than I was a year ago, but it does mean that I discipline myself to the point of where I'm as good, if not, if not better. Usually you get better a lot. You tell any musician in the world, they'll tell you, yeah, I played every day. I, mean, I play every day. Right. You know, a musician will play every day. Right. Whatever it is they play, they will play every day. Yeah. And they want to. It's not like they love it. It's yeah. their passion. I mean, nobody nobody's telling them not to write or not to paint. You know. Um, they matter of fact they just leave me alone. They left me alone. That's why I like to do it. Yeah. I like to play baseball because people would leave me alone. <laughs> my parents would leave me alone, my family would leave me alone, and I could do this, and they would just leave me alone because I was entertaining myself. It was a, and it was a safe space. It, for, very for safe you. It saved my life. Yeah. Yeah, because there was a lot of, uh, coming from Primera Flats, where I came from, El Oyo was right there, and White Fence, and, and Maravilla, and, and all of the major, major streets and, and gangs that were in that area. Yeah. Come from there. 
we were right in the middle. We were on Cheeseboro Lane that didn't belong to really anybody. You could go into any, I could go into any one of those gangs and become part of them. But it was, uh, I, I didn't have the time. Well, yeah, what, what do you think kept you out of the, the streets? The, playing the, yeah. the game. <laughs> I had no time. I just didn't have time to, to hang out and, and, and yeah, on the streets doing anything. I, I was so caught up in trying to understand what I liked. Yeah. And uh, again, I've, I've spoken to thousands and thousands of people. And I always tell them, I said, you know, I'm not naturally gifted. I'm not naturally talented in anything. Everything that I've been able to understand about myself has been by educating myself, training, doing it, doing it, doing it, and then you become, you know, better at it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you become so good at it that you become the best that you can be. And then sometimes the best that you can be happens to be, just happens to be the best that people have ever seen. That you can't tell whether that's going to happen or not. Or, or the best in that moment. Exactly. Right? Yeah. In that, yeah, in that, gener so. in that generation. That's right. Something you said just reminded me of, of something that you previously have, have mentioned. You say you never thought you were going to to make money in this. And, and I quote, you said, the idea was just to be the best that I can be in whatever it is that I was doing. And I found that very powerful. That to me is the essence of living. That was it. And to this day, I'm 76. I know I look good. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> 50s? But I'm a little viejito. Okay? <laughs> I'm a little old, guys. And it went by fast. It went by too fast. I mean, I was talking to a friend of mine who I've had since I was uh, five years old. And uh, we've been together as friends. And I talked to him every day. I was with him yesterday all day uh, for 71 years. OK? That's beautiful. Un japonesito. Yeah. Japonesito. <laughs> How'd you guys meet? Oh, in school. Grade school. Yeah. <laughs> First grade. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what was incredible, we were talking, you really realize that um, in today's time, that's all you have. All you have is really uh, an essence of understanding who you are, what you are, and to have good friends. And the friends that you meet and you understand and you tend to be able to, to extend yourself. Because I don't have a lot of friends, except a few of them. And those friends are really good friends, you know. And uh, it's been uh, quite an experience. Yeah. No, I I love um, that you that you followed your your passion. And, you know, you said you didn't really have a lot of um people to really look up to what what fueled you in 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 that time well again it was a passion for what i was getting into when i was in baseball i was really good what position did you play everything yeah wow no, i understood that like, when these kids started to come up and they could play third base they could play first base they could shortstop right field left field they could catch they could pitch you know and you see these guys doing that, everybody goes, oh, well, we were doing that back in the 50s and 60s. Yeah. <laughs> we played, and if they needed a second baseman, I okay, I'm on second base, <laughs> you know, the third base. And you would learn the different positions. Yeah. And the key ingredient to baseball is batting. It's, it's you know, the, the offense, being really good at being able to hit the ball. And uh, there's where I really became, I was very fortunate. I was raised around an area that had a, uh, the Takahashi family. Mm. The Takahashi family, where it was a, a local little family. The, the three brothers, Kenjo Ken, Taka, Takahashi, uh, Hiroshi, and Saburo. And those three, Saburo was my friend. He's on the, the three of us, Saburo Jay and myself, Jay Nomura, Saburo Takahashi and myself, uh, hung out together. And we just hung out together a couple of weeks ago. We hadn't seen each other in years with Saburo. Saburo moved to Minnesota. And so we hadn't seen him in decades. So we got in touch with him and we, we laughed and we cried. And oh, it was wow. so much fun. And, uh, but Jay and I have been 
together almost every we talk every morning oh wow that's amazing we talk every morning because it's one of the things you have to do in this life you have to become understanding of the relationship between us as human beings and when you can extend yourself and find someone that you can talk to daily mm -hmm. and laugh i mean really laugh and not laugh at mm -hmm, right. but laugh because you are talking with each other i like i'll call him up in the morning and as soon as i call him he goes ah, he starts laughing <laughs> he just starts <laughs> laughing and i start laughing and then we'll laugh without saying anything it's just like <laughs> that's what we do it's right just, we can't believe that we're doing it again right and we're sitting we're laughing and that laughter and that communication that community that unity of, of humankind connecting with each other very important for the spirit and it's uh, one of the most healthiest things that you can do on this planet is to have people that you can relate to daily yeah not just once every while that's why the uh the sadness of of what happened during the uh, uh pandemic mm -hmm. was very difficult it was difficult for me and i didn't see anybody i didn't see my grandchildren i didn't see my children i didn't I, the only thing i had was my dog that i stayed with him but i saw no people for a year I'm too old, and I, and uh, I didn't want to, you know, catch it. And, right, and, it was a scary time. Yeah, it was. What would you say was was the biggest lesson uh, that you that you took from from the pandemic? Um, well, I think basically I, I I learned that the most important and crucial things in life were things that I knew, but that uh, was personified them and, and put them into pinpointed them was the fact that all you have is family that's it you know uh rich and famous and you know uh, success all that great that's outside but inside of you is the, the key to your existence is your family your mother your father your children you know your brothers your sisters your grandchildren uh, that unity and some people you know don't have that Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, you know, they have not instilled in themselves forgiveness enough to allow people to have made mistakes that they made, and you forgive them. You know, you don't forget. You just forgive them. Forgiveness is the key to living. Just about. If you don't know how to forgive, you're in trouble. Because everybody's going to blow it. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to make it hard for you to understand yourself, and that's really. All I ever tell my grandchildren, especially when they're real strong, I say, don't let anybody make you something that you're not. Huh? <laughs> Just memorize it. I'll say it to you again. Don't let anyone make you something that you're not. Right. It'll, it'll make sense in, yeah, in a couple yeah, years. <laughs> memorize it. Get it. And then one day you'll be walking on going, hey, this person is making me feel like dog doo doo. Yeah. You know? And you say, oh, wait a minute. What did my grandpa say? Don't let anyone make you something that you're not. Okay, I'm not dog doo doo. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man. What you're saying is, you can feel whatever way you want to feel, but guess what? Ain't gonna cross inside, man. You yeah. ain't gonna get me. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, there, there's there's definitely so much that that was missed during that that time of the pandemic. Family mm -hmm. gatherings, you know, celebrations. So you and I, speaking of celebrations. <laughs> We have a day apart on birthdays. So you're February 24th. I'm the 25th. Hey, all right. Are you big on, on birthdays? Well, yeah. yeah? You, I celebrate the hell out of them. Are you kidding? I made it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try to make it to 120. Love people, that. People look at me and they say, why in the world would you want to be 120? What are you talking about? I said, well, for one thing. To make it to 120, you would have had to have gotten to 119. In order to get to 119, you would have had to have gotten to 118. And God willing, you're able to understand yourself enough to get there without any of the elderly diseases. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if you get elderly diseases, then basically you're not going to make it. The only way you're going to make it to 100, 105, 115, 110, 115 is by way of, of you you maintain a sense of balance. And, and I do. I, I, 
the key to existence is to exercise mm. and food, what you eat and how much you, you, you exercise your body. And uh, you stay in condition. That saved my life just recently. In this last year, and I'll be very honest with you, I haven't told anyone publicly. This will be the first time publicly I'll be coming out and saying it. But I had throat cancer. I just finished getting through it uh, December 20th. This was my last uh, uh, radiation. And this, the week before, I'd finished my chemo. And months and months I was on radiation and chemo as, as it attacked my throat. And I still have, right here, I still have a bump where my lymph nodes, they burned them out because they, they, they shot this area wow. with, with radiation. The, the doctors would say, I had five doctors. The doctors would say, uh, right before I started, they said, Ed, there's only one thing we have to tell you. I said, okay, tell me. He says, we do not, we do not know what you're gonna sound like. Mm. I said, what? Sorry, man. We're shooting your vocal cords. We're shooting your throat, where you eat, where you swallow, where you talk, where you, you know, breathe. Everything goes through here. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. we're shooting it. And it becomes the hardest place to shoot, to use radiation and, and chemo. A lot of my friends have, have passed because of this. Wow. You know, it's a very strong disease. Cancer is period, but uh, in the throat, it's really difficult because it's, oof, man, it took a lot. Months and months and months. So I sit here saying now to you, Mondo, and friends, that uh, uh, it uh, was something I'm very grateful that one of the things that I did, which I was very thankful for, was that I was, again, conditioned for to fight this. Mm -hmm. I was in good condition. Um, and I still am. I, I uh, swim a mile a day at least, sometimes two miles a day I'll swim. Wow. Every day, seven days a week. Okay. And then I, I row, do rowing. Yeah. No and, row. and I do weights and stuff like that. But the main things is rowing and, and, uh, and swimming. And so I, I was swimming. Uh, so I was in good shape. Right now, I lost uh, about 55 pounds. Wow. So I was much stronger. And uh, I lost all my muscle. So in the last four months, I've been coming back slowly, you know. And uh, this morning, doing 25 minutes of uh, rowing was... That's such a good workout. It is, but it's hard. <laughs> well, I'd like to pause and, and thank you for, for sharing that with us. And uh, also for congratulate you to for for beating cancer it's yeah. it's a can, can we <laughs> give that a round of applause i think that's 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 such a blessing and uh i'm sure you it was it was another perhaps wake up call too right oh yeah big one yeah i mean it's it's there was times in the months that i was undergoing the treatments that the body gives up and uh I didn't want to take my food through my stomach. They want mm. to put tubes in and feed my, my nutrients because I couldn't swallow. And so I said, no, I, I, I don't want to do that. And uh, so my children, my uh, daughter-in-law, who's a great, she's a great uh, attorney, immigration attorney, but she's also a better chef. <laughs> so she started to make me uh, uh, shakes and, and nutrient drinks because mm -hmm. I needed to take uh, uh, Kate Farms makes a little drink, a little container drink that uh, uh, has uh, 500 calories and nutrients in it. And I would drink that. I'd drink about three or four of them. I had to get... 2,500 calories into my body every day. That was ridiculous. That was so hard. I mean, oh my God. I, I can't even tell you, drinking water, I had. I was getting intravenous water because I couldn't drink it. Wow. And so every day I would get my, my, my bags of water put in there so I wouldn't dehydrate. And uh, it was, and at night, oh, oh. 
it was uh, an experience that changed me, changed me totally. The, uh, the understanding of how wonderful this life is. You know, I've been through some experiences that have gotten me close to death, but that was, oof, that was really close. Yeah. Because at night, I would wake up in the middle of the night gagging. And thank God I would wake up. Because this is exactly what happens to people who, like, either get real drunk or are on drugs, <coughs> and they vomit. And then they die of that. Yeah, or have what is it, GERD or acid reflex? Like people sometimes die; they choke. Yeah, they choke yeah. to death. And you, you, just, you can't breathe, and and you die. You don't wake up. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I I would wake up, man. I would wake up. It would be very difficult. Yeah, because I'd be in pain, such pain. I can't even tell you. And then um, I I didn't want to take the pain medicine because it constipates you. Hmm. hydrocodone is what they would try to give me and I did it for one day for four pills I took over every hour would take a pill and then I didn't go to the bathroom for like a month and I said this is not healthy this is worse than the pain mm -hmm. you know because now I have right. calories and not granted I was taking it through liquid yeah but it still right. goes in the digestive system and it becomes waste, and you have to get rid of it. And so, and so then I had to start doing, uh, you know, laxatives and, and uh, lavativas. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Know, good old fashioned. You know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I had to do that, and to get myself to be able to do, get back into to using my digestive system, and it was brutal. Yeah. What What would you say advice or share uh when it comes to families that are are have someone in, in in their in their um in their family that is going through cancer that is going through an illness like that what what, what would you recommend is is the best way of, uh, the, the of key, fighting it together yeah, the key ingredient is to be around them you know just stay with them and uh give them a whole lot of support you know and uh and by all means, uh, try to catch the disease early. <coughs> I've had cancer twice. Wow. Had prostate cancer, took it out. Um, then I had this cancer, fought it. And I got to tell you, both times I found the cancer, stage one. Wow which is nothing more than, it's not luck. That's not luck. That's going to the doctor since I was 40 years old to get checkups, you know, and, and yearly checkups and sometimes bi-yearly checkups twice a year. But, you know, doing going to the doctors and getting, uh, you know, a lot of people can't afford to go to the doctors and that's what I really detest what we've done to ourselves politically in this country because we can afford to give health care we can yeah. and uh, you know again it gets to who, who's going to pay for it what do you mean who's going to pay for it we are we pay for everything else what do you think every single person that makes a dollar has to give so much back yeah. to the government so yeah okay government you guys you know you guys don't pay anything you guys don't even do I don't think they pay taxes on the money that they get as senators and stuff like that yeah <clears throat> And presidents and but you know I know for a fact that uh, we can afford this country can afford to give uh, health care to everyone and uh, so that we can catch it the, the key is catching it but sometimes we think that you know that we're uh, too young to get it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'm not gonna catch that I'm 26 I feel good yeah I felt great you know, I felt great. I didn't feel sick when I got cancer wow. either time. They found it and uh, PSA when, when my prostate and uh, uh, the throat because I had a swollen lymph node gland. And I felt it and I went to my doctor and said, hey, man, I got a gland here that's swelling up. And in the old days, you'd get a swollen gland and you'd take an aspirin or whatever, man, lay down and get some rest. That's all you need. And there was nothing, no big deal. You go to sleep, you wake up, and the thing's gone. Oh, okay. 
but when you're in your 70s, you, you think differently. Yeah. And so I immediately, as soon as I felt that, I go, oh, what the heck's this? I go, oh, that's weird. You know, one day I had it, and the next day I didn't. And and I think what it was is I got COVID. I got COVID like in March of 2022. And I had had all my shots and uh, I had taken all my, I had been taking care of myself pretty well. And so I got it. And uh, uh, I took those pills that they give you. And if you take it right at the beginning, you have to take it for five days and it kills it. Mm -hmm. And it did. It worked very well for me. And uh, so, and ended up, you know, about two, three months later is when this thing comes up. You know, I don't smoke, I don't drink, uh, you know, I don't really do, at my age, anything really, to abuse myself in any way. So I couldn't understand. So I went out to the doctor, the doctor said, let me send you to a throat, ear, and nose doctor. I said, okay. So my general practitioner sent me over to see this other doctor, and I went there, and he said, let me take a biopsy of that. He goes, I said, okay. So I went and got a biopsy, and I came walking. He said, come back tomorrow, and I came back tomorrow, and I come walking in the door. <laughs> Boy, talk about bedside manners. Um, <laughs> this doctor was down the hallway, and I had been at least 25, 30 feet away. And he says to me, He's walking towards me. I'm walking towards him and people in, in, in the office, <laughs> office workers. And he, I'm walking. He goes, "You got cancer." No way. <laughs> I said, <laughs> "I said to myself, well, that was pretty. I mean, not sit down, relax, and tell you." Something. Yeah, yeah, Come yeah. Come into my office. Nothing. He said, "You got cancer," and so I'm walking towards him, and I walked right up to him and I looked at him and I said, "Well, what are you going to do about it?" <laughs> with the same kind of understanding he told yeah, me yeah. that so what are you going to do about it <laughs> he goes well I'm going to send you right now and I mean it went I mean boom Yeah, these guys and, and I went with him and <laughs> he says you're going to go down and see this doctor and this doctor right now Wow. I said okay I'm on giving the numbers and I walked, went over in the meantime I called another friend of mine who's a, a head of Valley Presbyterian Hospital. He used to be he's not any longer. He was for the head for many, many years. And I called him up and I left a message because I wanted to check on the doctors that they, I didn't know the doctors I was going to go see. So they said, uh, so he calls me back about an hour later. And now I'm going down to see the other doctors down there. And in. he calls me. <coughs> and I tell him, hey, I've got to see these doctors. And they had to give him the names of the doctors. And he says, okay, I'll call you back. He was in Budapest. He was in Europe. He was on vacation. He's like 88 years old. He's, him and his wife were out and, and exploring the world. And so he calls me back and he says, they're excellent. These guys are really good. And uh, I said, okay, thank you very much. So I felt comfortable not knowing them and allowing them now to take over my life. Yeah. Literally. So we ended up... Uh, Going into combat, man, man, they, I mean, within six days, boom, chemo, radiation, everyday radiation, chemo for two months. Wow. How long was, were you, were you battling? What time, how long were you fighting for? Months. Months. Yeah. And, uh, wow. You know, it, it, uh, it was quite an experience. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm very grateful that yeah. they did it. And then they brought in, three other doctors, you know, I had a team. They set up a team that, uh, to help fight it. One on nutrition, one on pain, uh, one on uh, exercise, you know, how to, how to keep yourself, you know, because you're working on this section, so you have to start working on it, mm. it. It destroys it all. Were you able to speak throughout or no? Yeah, but it was tough. Yeah. It was really tough, yeah, because it hurt so much. It hurts right now, but I have medicine that I take and I put in there and along the inside of my, my throat because it, the radiation lacerated my jawline. Yeah. <laughs> and so it was raw. And uh, so it just recently, over the last four months, I stopped in December 20th. So here we are on the 22nd of 
of, uh, of May, so it's been uh, about five months, four months. Yeah, five months. Yeah, five months to yesterday. And two days ago, you went back to working. I went back to work, and I told, I called my uh, the guys, and I asked the doctor first. I said, "How long? Okay, I got a. I was supposed to start the season on fe December fifth, and I was still getting treatments. I didn't start wow. my treatments until, and they didn't know about it. Nobody knew anything. I didn't tell anyone anything, except my immediate family. And um, sure enough, man, I, you know, I called him. Uh, they had a the creator, you know, and I asked him, uh, hey, I told him, hey, listen, I have cancer of the throat and I won't be able to be in there on December 5th to start the, the episodes off. <clears throat> and he goes, oh, don't worry. And he was so taken aback. I said, no, don't worry. Yeah. We'll get through this, all right? And, uh, Okay, man, if you need anything, I said, all I need you to do is just keep it within yourself. And because uh, the last thing I needed was people calling friends of mine who are worried about me, which are, there's many that yeah. I know through my lifetime, calling me up and asking me, how are you feeling? <laughs> well, I really can't tell you anything right now because I'm dying just trying to talk to you. <laughs> right, right. Wow. <laughs> it was That's... so crazy. Wow. It was so crazy. That's uh, yeah. I'm sure that was very eye-opening, and you know, I've had I've had family members who have have gone through, um, you know, to have gone to, to to fight and 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 unfortunately have lost the fight too. You know, and um, yeah, I have too. I've had a lot of friends that have died of cancer. Such a yeah, such a such a blessing. And yeah. speaking of of the show Mayans, um, we've had uh, Emily Tosta in here. Oh, we've had Emilio Rivera in here. Um, and they speak very highly of you, as I mentioned, you know, at the top of the show. Uh, what is your favorite thing about Mayans and being a part of it? The family, the family unit, these guys, everybody. It, it's a different kind of show. It's, this is a very dark show. If people saw uh, Sons of Anarchy mm -hmm. and they enjoyed it, this is better. Watch this show. So, oh boy, is it better. It's not that it's better, it's just different, and the difference is really strong. So, <clears throat> the family in it, because as far as the stories are concerned, it's too dark. I don't, I tell people not to watch it. I said, don't watch this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like, don't watch this stuff for me. <laughs> it's like watching John Wick. You know, you go to see John Wick movies, man. You're gonna see him kill fifty-eight thousand guys. You know, yeah, boom, boom, yeah, yeah. Boom, 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 With boom. one That's shot. Like yeah, it's all he does is kill people. Do you remember Mario Almada? He was a a Mexican actor, and and he would often my my tios my my parents would watch Mario Almada movies, mm -hmm. and he was oh, he always had guns, and he was one of those like. With one shot, he'd kill like five guys, and another shot, he'd kill another six. Do you do you recall the I name? I don't remember that. I have, <laughs> I have no time to watch that kind of stuff. I, I don't make those kind of movies. I, yeah. This one, Mayans, I wouldn't have made it. Yeah. I mean, if if I had choice of making or not making it, I wouldn't have made it. But when they asked me for the to help them, and I understood why, this is all Latino cast, mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. and and it was a story that was based on fact. This is a truth that we have to come to terms with. <clears throat> and so, that being said, you know, and they needed to balance it. They needed they needed a foundation, a root. And uh, I knew what they needed. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll come in and I'll help you understand this. This is going to be kind of tough for me, but you guys know what you're doing and why you want to do it. So let's let's go ahead and try it. And we did, and it was successful. Very successful. Yeah, no. Every it's... year it got better. Every year it became more and more understandable. And now we're in, we just finished our fifth season two two weeks ago, and now um, it's over. You know, we completed final season. Show, yeah, five, five five seasons of the show, and it was good. You you've done so many uh, iconic <laughs> movies, films, plays, uh, series. Now um, we had Constance Marie in here. Oh, that and great lady. great lady and and she, she played my wife she played you know <laughs> played many many different stars yeah 
she she brought up uh, your your line in Selena, right? You got to be more Mexican than the Mexicans. Oh, boy. And more. You more. You got to be more Mexican than the Mexican. You got to be more American than the American. You got to be able to eat, you know, eat uh, American food, which is way too bland. And you, you got to eat, if you eat Mexican food, you got you get the runs. So, you know, <laughs> it's, it's like anything else. As a Latino American today, the story is pretty much the same. I still feel like I have to be more Mexican than the Mexicans and more American the, than the Americans. Yeah. I don't think it's changed at all, you know, and uh, it's look, I used to go across the border with my family to drive to Mexico, to Mexico City, because that's my father was born and raised there. And uh, so what was interesting is we'd go across there and going across, we'd get there and they would, the, the Mexicans would call us pochos, yeah. which is, I learned real quick, was a really endearing word to call somebody <laughs> when you were pocho. It wasn't a kind thing to say to somebody, but uh, okay, I understood it. Then when I come back, we get to the, the the border, and you know we had to prove that we were American, you know, with our passports and everything. And you still had to, you know, yeah, we're U.S. citizens. Yes, we are. Yes, yes, we are. <laughs> I know we look like Mexicans because we are, but you know we are definitely. So you had to prove yourself going both ways. And uh, it's been that way still, still that way. Yeah. You, you know, you gotta be more Mexican than Mexican. You gotta be, you know, more American than the American, always. I love uh, that when you first started, you went by Eddie James, right? Edward James Olmos. You say Edward James, we say Santiago Olmos, that's my phone. And, and someone at a studio yeah. Right? I love that story, if you don't mind sharing that. Yeah. So you room by Eddie James, and they're like, hey, you should change your name to... Like well, no, when I wanted to start working as an actor in, in, the, in, the, in the business, it was Eddie Olmos. Eddie, Eddie Olmos, Eddie Olmos. Eddie Olmos. And uh, the casting director and head of the, of the production at, uh, I think it was MGM. I think it was MGM said to me one day, he says, hey, man, you know, you sure you don't want to be a lawyer or something? You know? <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? He goes, well, well you, you, you know, he'd just look at me and say, you know, it's going to be kind of hard for you in this business because I was just starting, didn't know anybody and, you know, trying to get inside of it. And he says, uh, because, uh, I mean, just, just even your name, you, you, I change your name, call yourself Eddie Starr, you know, <laughs> call yourself something else, but don't call yourself Eddie Almost. I mean, and I looked at him and I said, oh my God, oh, you're right. And I stood up slowly and I go, you're right. Thank you. Thank you so much. I so appreciate it. That's it. You're, from now on, it's going to be Edward James Rumos. <laughs> You're right. Thank you so much. The guy just looked at me and said, oh, macro. <laughs> and from that moment to today, you, you have to use my full name. <laughs> On anything and everything, you, people walk up to me and, you know, try to cut it short. And I said, no, I'm Edward. And if you don't even know me, you call me Mr. Olmos. Yeah. <laughs> and if you want to put in my doctorates, then you call me Dr. Olmos. Okay? <laughs> yeah. But you do not call me, you know, anything other than that. And uh, I mean, there's some people who call me Eddie, my mother, okay, <laughs> some of my whole friends. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, a lot of my friends call me. I love that. That after that moment, you're like, okay, yeah, that's it. I'm going from by Edward moment, James, James almost. almost. The whole thing they had to put across <laughs> the, cute, the, the marquee, everything, yeah. everything. It was on, and then if you see it, it's all Edward uses all three three of his names, and it's really long, and it, it caused a lot of uh, uh, understanding. And uh, basically, though, it, it proved to me one thing that. Uh, they were right. Martin Sheen changed his name for a reason, you know. Uh, many, many great artists, there were Latinos changed their name for a reason. 
And that reason was that the discrimination and prejudicisms against uh, people who are not Caucasian or Anglo-Saxon in this industry was pretty intense mm -hmm. and straightforward. They didn't, there was no qualms about it. So to this day, it's still the same. I mean, we are more than 20% of the population and we're less than 4% of the images that you see on film and television to this day, right today, 2023. And um, it's going to change. It's going to change. Uh, I hope to see it in, in my lifetime. That's how come I need to be 120. You're living in, yeah, until you're 120. <laughs> you'll, you'll see it. I hope. That's why, that's <laughs> you why will. I go that distance. You will. You will. I'm hoping, you know. But you figure that uh, it's changing because the, the uh, we ourselves are changing it. You couldn't, they're not going to change it for us, okay? That's why I started producing back in 1981 I produced my first uh, film the ballad of Gregorio Cortez and uh, from that moment on I, it was whew. and uh, once I did Zoot Suit everything changed for me mm -hmm. and the industry looked at me completely different too immediately I, I did uh, some major pieces of work that were yeah really and when you played Mr. Escalante too stand and I mean, deliver that was 88 yeah that was that was an amazing film as well. Yeah, it was beautiful. I produced that one too. Uh, but we started producing things, and we started to create our own work. Yeah. And to this day, I tell my everyone young, I tell Danny, and Pino, and, and uh, you know, J D. Pardo. I tell them, you know, direct. Yeah. And they have. They directed Mayans. So you guys got to start directing. You guys got to start producing. You guys got to start writing. You have to, because you're in a position to be able to do that. Other guys, other people won't be, are not in that position. Yeah. They don't have that ability to, to say, I want to direct and the Lord's going to let you direct if you've never directed before, you know, but they are super confident artists who can take on that responsibility and they right. have and they're doing it very well. A lot of the episodes being done this year on, on uh, Mayans, mm -hmm. done by them. They're directing. Yeah, and it's, it's a beautiful thing to, to see those kind of stories, mm -hmm. you know, um, be in the limelight. And, and I feel like, you know, Mr. Almost, you kicked that off. You kick that off for, for us, for our culture, for Latinidad, right? And that's what we're doing with Mondo and Friends. We're, we're sharing, we're telling these stories that need to be told uh, Latino voices and giving them a platform mm -hmm. and and uh, you know you're you're a big inspiration for that um, I want to talk about La Leaf mm -hmm. before I let you go mm -hmm. La Leaf is the Los Angeles Latino International Film Festival mm -hmm. uh, that you founded uh, tell me a little bit about La Leaf by the way we are media partners of La Leaf Hubway Media here for many, many years, and, and we're super proud of it. But please, tell us uh, about La Leaf. Mondo and friends, I'm very grateful. I am so grateful to you guys. And Hubway, your company. Yes. I'm very grateful for being uh, sponsors and for helping us bring this to the community. I mean, everything I've done for the community, I do it nonprofit. And uh, it usually costs me money to be able to run my companies. And uh, I, I created uh, Latino International Film Festival. Uh, we created uh, the Latino uh, Film Institute. We created the Latino Public Broadcasting. We created uh, the uh, Youth Cinema Project, which is functioning in a very high way and high manner in the present moment. It's amazing what that does. I highly recommend everyone looks into us today. Go online and just put in Youth Cinema Project and watch what you find. <coughs> it's very important. And uh, yeah, that that's become a, a, I started Alif in 1998. Marlene Dermer, myself, uh, George Hernandez, and Kirk Whistler, the four of us created, were the founders of, of uh, Alif. Los Angeles International Film Festival, and uh, it's become the backbone for a lot of 
great artists that have materialized and moved forward showing their product. This year, we're on the 31st of, of May, mm -hmm. which is a few days away, we're showing uh, Ava Longoria's... Uh, Flaming Hot. Flaming Hot. And it's uh, her first uh, film that she's directed. It's beautiful. It's a great film. It's a great... I saw it. It's funny. It's enlightening. It, it, it really inspires you. And a uh, fun, fun piece of work. I Why love that. Not? It's about the Cheetos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who invented the Cheetos. <laughs> yeah. Richard Montañez. Yes. The, 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 the person who, yeah. who uh, is behind inventing the, the hot Cheetos. Cheetos. Blame yeah. and hot. Yeah, no, I love that. It was great. That, it's a great show. Great. Yeah, it's a great film. And yeah. uh, again, you know, kudos to you and your team at La Leaf. Um, I've watched so many Latino films on on uh at like la leaf and you guys give a platform you know it's sort of like a platform to have these films skyrocket you know these mm -hmm. these these films that a lot become iconic as well you know i think flaming hot is going to be one of those classic films yeah for, i think it'll take off I for think. many many years to it come would go, it would take off without being in la leaf i'm just grateful that, that ava you know Eva Longoria decided to give us the opportunity to premiere it the world premiere will be there at the latino international film festival Lastly, we're going to do rapid fire with Edward James Olmos. You ready for this? If I fall asleep, it's only because I don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite Spanish word? Orale. Orale. <laughs> That's a great Spanish word. 1,000% Chicano. <laughs> Orale. <laughs> Go ahead. Favorite salsa? Is it roja or verde? Home, por favor. I take the Roja. Best singer of all time? Uh, I say Richie Valens. Mm. Oh my God. When I heard him sing O'Donnell, oh, he left too young. Yeah. He was only 17 years old and he had just started to kick. But, you know, he was so good. And uh, Lou Diamond Phillips did a brilliant job of performing. And Luis Valdez directed that and wrote that. And that that movie and if you haven't seen it it's a good movie to watch la bamba it's such good, a beautiful yeah. film yeah, i watched like that selena. i watched that in a uh drive-in i like selena too selena i saw i saw selena in a drive-in too yeah, exactly. <laughs> like she sings fantastic richie and selena and, you know there's been a lot of great singers yeah for sure. I like the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> when when my my dad were watching a show called Siempre en Domingo mm -hmm. sure. and so he said forever. Yeah. And he this was back in the day and he said, Oh, today the Bee Gees are gonna be on. I said, The Bee Gees? I think you mean the Beatles, Dad. This is I was really young. He's like, No, the Bee Gees and the Bee Gees performed on Siempre en Domingo. So he lost it. I've never seen my dad so hyped, so so excited to watch great, anything great. on TV. Uh, they're personal friends of mine. They're they're almost all gone except for the older brother. He's the only one that's left. But wonderful, wonderful guys, people, families. That was a great family. I met them back in 1984, and I, I was with them all the time. And great, great people, human beings, and and great songwriters. Yeah, are you kidding? They were fantastic songwriters. Favorite Latino food dish. <sighs> Chile Verde, Ooh. you know, with the carne de, de, de you Is know, it carne like, molida? No, no, no. Carne de puerco. Oh, carne de and puerco. Spare ribs, you know. <laughs> I love that. Now, lastly, what's a nickname of yours that no one really knows about? <laughs> you got to tell, you gotta tell us that one. Yeah, the no, first one that came to yeah, mind. Yeah, the first one that came to mind. <laughs> it's so, you know, uh, God, I, you know, it was so funny because it, it flashed in my brain as you said it. Uh, Chili Eddie. Chili Eddie. Chili Eddie. Chili Eddie. And Why would they call you Chili Eddie? Well, because I was so chilly. I was cold. I was, you know, <laughs> tough. And, <laughs> and, chilly. and uh, Isaac Reese, I think Pepe Serna were the two that used to call me that. And they started it. Back in the 1970s. Chile. <laughs> well, I say this respectfully. 
Chili Eddie, thank you so much for coming to <laughs> Mondo and Friends. Everybody make some noise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For Mr. Edward James, almost. Thank you again for coming. Thank you so much, Mondo. And thank you so much for watching and listening to Mondo and Friends presented by Verizon.